Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Dave Jones. Uh, I'm uh, with Storm Center Communications, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. And uh, you may also recognize Karen Mo. Karen is also uh, a co-chair of the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster. We we were sort of um, uh, there in the early days uh, as the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster was forming and evolving and all that sort of stuff. So it's great to see Karen. If you have anything you'd like to say, Karen's just coming off of laryngitis, so she might not have a whole lot to say, but uh, Karen, please. Oh, just a comment that the Disaster Lifecycle uh, Cluster has been around for more than a dozen years. Uh, started uh, back with uh, Emily Law uh, at JPL, uh, and uh, so it's been really quite interesting to see its evolution over over the many years. And um, I think at this point we're seeing, um, I know that uh, I personally am, am very involved in air quality and its impact. Um, Dave is starting out the wildfire, wildfire cluster. Uh, I, th I still think flooding is a major disaster uh, source that uh, you know needs uh, continued attention. And really hoping today that we have an opportunity to uh, focus uh, the disaster life cycle uh, activities uh, for the next year or determine you know just where uh, we as the subgroup uh, you want to go uh, moving forward now that we have some other clusters also addressing uh, you know specific areas of of disasters and, and their impact and what the uh, kind of uh, information needs there are, uh, both for uh, people who are the responders, uh, people who are interpreting science data and, and helping the public as well as information directly for the public. So uh, I think uh, today's gonna be an interesting session kind of exploring uh, those questions uh, as we kind of wrap up our, um, three years focus I think we've had on on wildfires uh, with our major meetings here. So um, yeah, it'll be an interesting session this morning. Yeah, that's true. Thanks so much, Karen. And, and we want to make this uh, interactive. Please, if you have any questions, put them into the chat. If you want to raise your hand and say anything, just please do that and we'll unmute you. Uh, you know, ESIP is uh, very welcoming and open and we want to make sure that we capture your input. Uh, because uh, you're here, uh, and that means you can make a difference, and uh, you can make a difference in where the disaster life cycle cluster heads. So I'm gonna you know, have to bear with me. We 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 also have as part of the uh, session here um, a number of uh, excellent uh, scientists. One of which was our ESIP fellow last year, uh, Sean Wong, and and Sean. Uh, you you took care of everything last year, so I have to do it this year. So we'll see if it bounces around and is not so smooth as it was before. But uh, but we'll move on and and I'll do the best that I can. So uh, it's great to see you, uh, Sean. As a matter of fact, you might want to just tell everybody real quickly what uh, you were with uh, University of South Carolina, but uh, things have changed for you. Tell us real quick where you've gone as a, a post ESIP fellow. Okay, as a post ESIP fellow, I am uh, a research assistant professor at East Tennessee uh, State University, located in Johnson City. So um, I'm keeping uh, keep working on something about rural health, public health, and the disasters. And thank you, Dave. It was my great pleasure to be in the as a fellow in the cluster for two years. Oh, uh, well, sure. and you all do a great job. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think it's so exciting to see how ESIP fellows get involved and then, uh, boy, really take off into into different areas, which is which is awesome. And that's what uh, uh, Chad's uh, doing here today, helping with this cluster uh, a, a little bit, at least today, um, who is uh, is a, an ESIP fellow. Matter of fact, Chad, if you if you can, just for a moment, uh, just just share in a, in a few sentences uh, what you're uh, doing and welcome uh, to ESIP. Hey, thanks, Dave. I, re I really appreciate it. Um, I am an ESIP fellow this year with the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, I'm an information sciences student. Um, I was in the Coast Guard. I did a 20-year career. And um, so 
the uh, emergency management disaster management is is a big part of what we do and that's part of the reason that I am here is to get some more, more information on that I have a project going on that um, a project going on that um, <laughs> that I would like to, I'd love to be able to create a standard language um, or at least propose a standard language for emergency management situations so um, you know I'm looking forward to being part of this conversation it's I have some practical experience with it and um and thank you so much again, Dave. I appreciate the introduction. Yeah, sure. No, welcome, Chad. And I, I'll tell you, it's the ESIP fellows are top notch. That's for sure. So let's uh, let's uh, dive into this here. Um, this is the uh, sort of cross-domain collaboratory post wildfire trusted data, uh, and uh, we're breaking it up uh, about halfway through. We're going to engage everybody and ask you about the disaster lifecycle cluster. Where would you like to see it head? Uh, in the future now that there's a wildfire cluster. So we'll be shifting shifting focus. Um, so just to let you know, um, uh, you know, we're an open and inclusive uh, organization here. Just want to uh, remind everybody if you're if you're not talking, just keep your microphone muted. Uh, turn your camera on when asking a question. We love to see you. We're 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 very much uh, uh, love to put faces with names. Um, add your location and, and information into the into the Google uh, uh, drive slide, uh, or that part of, um, of the meeting, uh, and please ask questions, you know, via chat or engage in, in conversations. Uh, the Google doc is ready to go with, uh, with your information. And so, uh, I believe the, the next slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, cause I think uh, I just learned how to do this. I'm going to, uh, pause my sharing for a second and, um, I'm going to, uh, orient everybody. Well, first, first, I'm 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 going to show this slide because I learned how to do something new with um, uh, with um, with the iPhone, and uh, Sean might recognize herself here. Uh, but the first the first question is going to be, how do you feel about ESIP? And I'm going to take you over to that poll here in just a second. You can scan it with your phone and all that sort of stuff and start answering. Uh, things here, but uh, just to let you know, you know, with an iPhone, <laughs> with the latest uh, uh, iOS and iPhone, if you take a picture of people, you can look at that picture. You can go into photos, just put your finger down onto a person, and it will isolate that person or two people. Uh, so you can then save that and then email it to yourself and use it as a as a background. So um, I, I thought I would just have some fun with the in person. Uh, meeting that we had uh in uh pittsburgh where i took some uh <laughs> took some pictures so we're going to go over now to the um here we go to the slido and i just want to ask you you know how are you feeling about ESIP? you can you can join slido and type in disaster life cycle uh you can scan the code and answer your question there um we can also put the um, the Slido in the chat there. So we got that in. Allison put the the link in there. So so let's see your answers uh, come on in. We'll just give it about a minute or so, so you can think about it and and answer the uh, answer the poll. We have two responses so far. I, I think it's always great uh, to see what you're thinking about ESIP. <laughs> dizzy <laughs> that's great seeing uh seeing dizzy i know what you mean and i'm sure that the esip uh, staff know exactly what you mean <laughs> my tribe is great <laughs> yeah tired yes indeed it's uh it's interesting uh over the last uh, the, the the first day of ESIP, um I participated in the morning and then in the afternoon had had uh, four sessions with the All Hazards Consortium to uh, uh, to moderate on extreme events and its impact to critical infrastructure. Uh, this is great. These uh, these questions are really uh, terrific. So we're gonna. We'll wrap it up. We'll give it another um, another thirty seconds or so as you answer these uh, questions. I love these word clouds too because uh, if you put in the same name, the it, it just gets larger. Um, 
Yeah, it is great to see friends. I, I agree uh, 100%. Uh, still seeing a participant typing in. And so, uh, so this is terrific. We have 11 people come back and there's all of those make perfect sense. Uh, exactly. And, you know, I think the unique thing about ESIP is, you know, since we're a bunch of uh, uh, data geeks, uh, I suspect um, that there's so many applications for data to whether influence or drive decision making to AI and ML and all the discussions are really uh, awesome. So we're going to go to the next uh, the next question. Um, like to get an idea for where you're from. Uh, what area do you work in? Research? Are you a data manager? Communications? Um, a developer? If you're if you're in the Slido poll, uh, that should advance automatically for you as we go to the next uh, the next question. And it's always great seeing this uh, this evolve. So you have a lot of research. And that was uh, that was pretty consistent as well with our wildfire cluster. Uh, the majority of the attendees were researchers. Um, and that's uh, kind of the area where you you know where you work in today. Communications, education, any education uh, folks? Developer eight. Okay, we have. Uh, all right, it's still. Majority researchers, which is really exciting. That's uh, have some more. We'll wait till it gets to to uh, fifteen. If we have fifteen, I don't know how many people are online here, but uh, looks like oh sixteen. So we're getting most everybody uh, participating. Okay, that's terrific. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question for you. See, we're making it easy in the early in the in in the early part of the day here. Uh, next question. Uh, is from zero to 100%. Look, see, this poll goes all the way to 100%. How much of your day do you dedicate to disaster-related work? Could be preparing data for disasters. It could be setting up services for disasters. Uh, could be somebody coming to you saying, hey, I know you don't work in disasters, but we'd like you to do something here related to this. Um, and it's just uh, just an estimate for how much of your day how much do you spend dedicated to disaster related work okay 13 respondents that's great so 23% of you, nothing. So maybe maybe this uh, maybe this session will change that a little bit if we can get some ideas flowing in your mind. So so that's great. Okay, the next question. How do you involve envision your involvement with the disaster lifecycle cluster? Uh, it's just a kind of a one through five. If you just want to stay informed, attend monthly meetings, you'll find that. We do have monthly disaster lifecycle cluster meetings where we come in and talk about different things. Uh, we ask speakers to come in and talk about their area of expertise and see how the disaster lifecycle cluster might uh, really uh, identify something unique that we can get involved in, that we can make a difference and kind of do that in six month intervals. Why? Because we want to present something at the summer meeting in Burlington, uh, which will be in person. Uh, maybe a poster, uh, maybe a presentation, maybe a video, something like that. So um, have uh, 11 responses. We'll still wait for a couple more to respond. Um, actively participate, attend monthly meetings, stay informed, roll up the sleeves. That's what I like. See, my sleeves are my sleeves are rolled up for for this uh, cluster meeting, and uh, I I tend to love to do that as well we want to see many of you get in, involved as well so 36 percent, great okay so the next question here imagine in five years the following news headline i don't have the daily profit like uh, uh douglas showed in the wildfire cluster from harry potter but 
Imagine this headline, the disaster response landscape has been forever changed by earth science data capabilities. That's the headline. What geospatial tools, data sets, and or stakeholder capabilities do you imagine have been created? What tools do you imagine have been created to get us to that headline that we've forever changed disaster response with earth science capabilities? And I'm going to give you a couple minutes to, to think about that. Really good responses. Exciting. Because what we're putting together here is uh, is uh, sort of like an initial part of a roadmap that we might want to consider for uh, going down uh, this path in the disaster life cycle cluster. So that is great. I'm going to pause uh, sharing again. We have 10 responses. Thank you all for participating in this. This is uh, terrific. It's giving us a, a really good opportunity uh, to uh, to address some some ideas. So what I'd like to do is now just show you. Um, Going to resume the sharing and uh, take this full screen and tell you how we got here. For those of you who who haven't been a part of the disaster lifecycle cluster in the past, um, Karen mentioned our our two to maybe three year journey through through wildfires in this cluster. Uh, but in January of 2021, we kicked off um, one of our meetings with California burning, putting data to work. And we talked about what kind of trusted data is available. Uh, we talked a lot about web services, talked a lot about states and federal agencies standing up web services to access. And uh, it's really been transformative over the last couple of years. Uh, being able to have uh, data curators provide their data as web services that can be accessed by any GIS platform for people to put into their own uh, emergency operations center. Uh, in July of 2021, we focused on the ESIP ecosystem of innovation, evolving this capability so that uh, we could bring ideas across ESIP, across clusters. Anybody who has some ideas that want to bring into and say, hey, you know what, we've been working on this output for AI and we would love for somebody to be able to look at it and determine whether it's valuable or not. So we put together this ESIP ecosystem of innovation within the disaster lifecycle cluster so we could deliver uh, data, prototype products, into uh, decision-making environments for different agencies. We also evolve the operational readiness levels, ORLs, and uh, I'll talk about those a little bit, where uh, we link ORLs into the All Hazards Consortium, which is comprised of 45,000 members, uh, mainly state emergency management agency personnel, sectors like the food, fuel, transportation, medical supply, logistics, utility, um, sectors where they really need and want to learn how to use more earth science data and put it into their decision-making processes. Some of them have GIS infrastructure set up. Others don't have GIS infrastructure set up. Uh, so they want to know how they can access that information with uh, making not a ton of investment uh, internally. In January of 2022, we went to Let's Talk Wildfires in this collaboratory, and we started talking about pre-wildfire data sets that might be available. Uh, what's out there? What can we leverage? What can we get access to? How can we really improve our own awareness and understanding of those data sets and how we can put them to work? And then in July of 2022, which was the uh, summer meeting, which was back in person. Yay, we were back in person in Pittsburgh. It was great. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of activities there and we talked about during wildfire, what kind of data sets are available during wildfire activities and, uh, so that we can put into decision-making environments. And so here in January of 2023, we're here to talk about post-wildfire data sets and information. And so, uh, we're going to be doing that uh, during this time. And at any time during the cluster meeting here, if you have ideas for data sets 
maybe things that you're working on, ideas of linking wildfires and air quality and, and putting those together. Uh, uh, we'd love to hear that. Put that in the chat and we would love to hear your input. Also, if you have a, a raised hand, please uh, please raise your hand as well. Um, we also have the ESIP Ecosystem of Innovation, which I just uh, blew up here in a larger slide, just so you can take a look, uh, because it's kind of putting our, our thoughts into a graphic here where, you know, ESIP has a lot of clusters. We hope that you participate in some of those other clusters, and you can see the linkages between those clusters, uh, because we, we don't spend a ton of time uh, focusing on what other clusters are doing. We're kind of going our way in the disaster lifecycle cluster, but there are so many good activities going on in the other clusters, we wanna bring them in uh, and cross fertilize. So this is about addressing real world use cases that ESIP clusters can address, put to use and test in operational environments. We have that operational environment together already. And as long as we can deliver those data sets or prototype products as web services, KMLs, CSV files, things like that, then we can bring in uh, feedback uh, from potential users. So Allison put in the chat, we have 30 plus collaboration areas. There is the, um, the link that you can learn more about what ESIP clusters are, uh, are bringing to the table. And so on the receiver end, you know, we work with groups like uh, agencies, USGS, All Hazards Consortium, State of Florida, National Weather Service. Matter of fact, the National Weather Service has a really uh, great uh, evolution going on in how they're providing information to decision makers. It's called Impact-Based Decision Support Services or IDSS. And while it's evolving, it's really about delivering data and information and telling the decision maker about the impacts that this particular forecast is going to have. Um, and so as part of that service, they want to be data interpreters, right? That's part of the definition of IDSS. How can they interpret data and deliver it to be more uh, useful for decision makers? And so uh, I'm taking that idea a little bit further and saying, well, they probably just don't want to interpret NOAA and National Weather Service data, but there's probably other federal uh, data out there that they would like to access in this uh, sort of collaborative environment so they can explain and enhance the experience of that decision maker. And so here's an example of a uh, dashboard that we use to uh, get information out to decision makers. Um, all of these are data services. This is a simple Esri JavaScript uh, map environment, uh, but it is collaborative. And so you can see this green area that we've circled around these, um, uh, these advisories from the Weather Service. Well, here's an example of linking a interactive data service into a NASA data center. So we can circle this area and pull out the population and demographic breakdown of people in that circled area. So it basically goes out and makes a call uh, to the CDAC, the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center at Columbia University, and pulls back population information, population from 2000 to 2020. And then you can see a population detail uh, that was out and analyzed in 2010. So more and more data services, hopefully if you're into that area, you can start to see how data services can be a great uh, benefit. And this is, uh, this is one example. So we also have other agencies. And you know, as you know, as we talked about in the beginning, this is about post wildfire data. What kind of threats uh, and risks exist after the wildfire goes out? Um, and so we've, we've, identified burn scars, right? When you have a burn scar in a burn area, uh, that changes the hydrophobicity of that soil, depending on the intensity of the burn. And uh, you can have lots of floods. We have seen that demonstrated in, uh, in real time over the last several weeks in California, as a series of strong low pressure systems have come 
uh, close to making it on shore, but the most impactful part has been the atmospheric river that those systems have tapped into and directed a stream of concentrated moisture into California and the West Coast that's then enhanced by the mountains and you get strong and heavy precipitation. So you get lots of floods. You have landslides, the mud flows, debris flows. And then you have the public that's out there trying to find out what their threats are, what they're under. They hear watches, warnings and advisories from the weather service, from their local media. Uh, but there's really no place they can go to see uh, all of these things together. Not that somebody has to offer all these things together, but to pull together the various web services that are being produced by those experts. If they need to evacuate, what's the evacuation route? They might have a separate app for evacuation routes. There might be 10 different apps out there uh, for different types of information. And how do we reach the underserved communities, those that are the most vulnerable, that might not have those apps together, um, that might not have that you know, information that they need at their fingertips? Or is there a network set up where people that might be off the grid can find out about threats? So, so we're really interested in talking about that kind of stuff, and we have been in the disaster lifecycle cluster. Uh, disasters have such a wide range of uh, impacts and uh, application areas, but we want to make sure that in the disaster lifecycle cluster, we can figure out something unique that we can bring to the table because, you know, we're from all different organizations, private sector, nonprofits, federal agencies, state agencies. But when we come together with an ESIP, we can be sort of like this other type of brain trust bubble where we can openly talk about challenges, openly talk about what is really needed. And then we can boil that down within the ESIP disaster lifecycle cluster and say, that's what we want to do. We want to try to bring that information uh, to the public or to a certain group of decision makers and uh, show that we're that we're unique. So post wildfire threats and challenges that we've worked on and that we've identified in the disaster life cycle cluster and includes the hydrophobicity, the soil changes in the burn scar areas. Uh, well, I found out over the last several weeks that, you know, even though uh, NOAA, for example, and, and the National Weather Service have an organization called the National Water Center, uh, where they're working on real time flood modeling. Uh, from fresh water and rainfall, uh, it currently does not take into account burn scars and how much faster water runs off burn scars into that watershed or into that water area. So is there anything available? Please help us understand what else is available from a burn scar perspective and figuring out how much water when it falls in that burn scar is going to drain into uh, the watershed. We've seen uh, mud flows, debris flows, and flash floods. Water contamination. This was a big one uh, in the Hermit's Peak Fire. Hermit's Peak Fire uh, occurred in, in uh, New Mexico. Turned out it was a, a prescribed burn. It was supposed to be kept uh, under control in a small area. Weather uh, got out of control and fanned the flames, and it became New Mexico's largest wildfire in their history. Uh, and it impacted many, many structures and people. Uh, and the uh, the head of the Forest Service even wrote a report um, saying that climate change and um, drought has really accelerated and changed the way that wildfire and fuels. Um, uh, stoke the flames and how wildfire behaves. And they have to do a real deep dive into how we can better model wildfire under this new paradigm of climate change. Water contamination, when structures are damaged, you might have all sorts of, you know, benzene and, and toxic materials um, washing down into reservoirs that feed the drinking water for, uh, for many communities. And we had one uh, particular community, as a matter of fact, in the write-up of the ESIP this session, uh, 
uh, there's an NPR story that you can click on and and uh, and watch that talks about a, a community that they were down to less than 30 days of water because of toxic chemicals going into their watershed and into their reservoir from a, a wildfire. And it was the Hermit's Peak fire. There's smoke uh, and debris in the atmosphere that has health and air quality implications. There's an air quality cluster. Karen Moe is very active in the air quality cluster. Um, they're talking about neighborhood air quality and, and there's other air quality hazards and that's wildfire smoke. Uh, so is that uh, an area that we wanna to head down to uh, in the future? Or that's something that the wildfire cluster uh, might look into. Modeling of burn scar uh, hydrology. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, uh, I didn't say I don't have all the attendees up here, but uh, I put in the in the slide here, um, Zach, Zachary Robbins from uh, from um, Los Alamos. Um, Zach, I know uh, if you're here, you do a lot of wildfire modeling. I'm just wondering if you are up on uh, any of the the sort of the wildfire modeling uh, advancements that that have happened that in, include hydrology. Are you aware of any of that? We might not have uh, Zach as part of the. Zach said I can unmute myself. Oh, he can't unmute. Oh. Um, hey, can you hear me? There he is. Hey, Zach, how are you? Good. Thanks, Dave. So there's a lot of work in this exact um, problem right now. As you and I discussed, and some of the audience members might be aware, one of the big problems in modeling this is it's really hard to know, even from remote sensing, the state of the soil following these fires. We know that fire at large increases hydrophobicity, but you really need an understanding of how the fire actually burned in order to understand where those things are going to uh, occur. And so we do a lot of work working with really mechanistic physics-based models of wildfire occurrence, particularly at the watershed scale. And so the hope is that you can combine this idea of knowing what the underlying vegetation is, as well as the fire's progression and its intensity to understand what the effects will be on the soil itself. We can then pair those model outputs of the burn and the estimated uh, hydrophobicity to hydraulic models. And there's a wide suite of these, some of them are highly mechanistic and at this point might be too mechanistic for application rapidly. However, I've been doing a little research on other kind of more simple models that seem to capture this dynamic quite well so that at least you could have some estimate of the increase in flow um, that have been parameterized to say flow meters and stuff throughout the watershed. Um, it's a it's a complicated issue, you know, and I, d I don't know that it's fully matured yet, but I think one of the great things that this group could do is put together some of the data needs for things like this in a common place so that researchers aren't dependent on just looking at, you know, sites for which they have studies, the ability to pull together rapidly kind of landscape scale data and then test those data you know, on areas where we have records of fire occurring. Is there anything else you wanted me to touch on in that regard? No, I, I think that's I think that's great, and that's that's excellent input. And and those of you who are participating that have knowledge of of modeling, I know one of the challenges that we have come across, and even in talking with some of the folks from the National Weather Service and the fire program, is that uh, that's one thing. Uh, unless it's changed over the last year, one thing that they really wish they knew more about, and that is uh, the, what happened to the soil in a particular burn, uh, because as soon as the rains come, you know, the, the flash flood guidance changes. Uh, it might, instead of two inches of rain to cause a flood, it might just need a quarter of an inch of rain. And so, you know, I, I, I'm i not a weather service forecaster, uh, but um, my my gut would tell me, well, we need to just, you know, issue flash flood watches wherever there's been a fire 
Um, and maybe that's needed. Maybe it's not needed. I'm not sure. Hey, Dave, this is Ram. I just have a quick question here. Yeah. I was wondering as I was listening to Zachary, whether um, SMAP, soil moisture data would, would help before and after uh, before and after the fire in this context. I would th I would think so. Uh, Zach, do you know of anybody working with the SMAP data for for soil moisture? And is the, you know, my always my first question is, you know, resolution and how frequently is the data collected? Do uh, you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I, I don't know that anyone's using it post fire. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the time fidelity would be correct for that. But I think it is kind of pulling together these sorts of data sources to make a reasonably predictive model. You know, it's a thing lots of people are working on, but I, I don't think one tool has risen to the top. So I would say, you know, use every data source to solve a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Rama, did you have anything else that you wanted to, to follow up regarding that? Uh, no. Okay. Just a quick thought came to my mind. So I just thought I'd blurt it out. That's great. And we appreciate that. And and everybody you see how these uh, clusters work, please, you know, if you have anything that you want to uh, want to mention, uh, please, please do it. Um, I know the weather service is, is very interested in quickly assessing. And I, I believe currently the process is they wait for the bear teams from the U S forest service the burn area emergency responders uh, to go in and uh, check the soil out and uh, give their report. Uh, but that could happen days later, a week later. Um, uh, I'm not sure of the actual timing of those bear reports. I think they are getting more timely based on some needs of the weather service. But there's got to be some remote sensing and and um, uh, that can be put to work. And I think uh, I, I have heard of some of some work being done at University of Wisconsin at Sims on analyzing burn scars using GOES and uh, and and the JPSS series of satellites. Hey, um, this is Rama again. Just yeah. have an additional thought on this. Uh, if the uh, SMAP satellite uh, data resolution and uh, frequency of acquisition is not sufficient for a particular purpose, perhaps special aircraft flights could be arranged when uh, disasters occur so that you can you can get that information uh, yeah. yeah yeah that's great uh, input it, it depends on of course the availability of such instruments i'm assuming that that's possible technologically anyway yes yes yeah and i know there's a lot of there's a lot of aircraft flying a lot of drones uh, that are that are flying have to be coordinated and things like that so um I, I haven't seen personally, doesn't mean that it's not happening, of course, I haven't seen uh, any concentrated efforts to determine the quality of the soil after a wildfire, specifically for uh, hydrologic modeling processes to provide input to the weather service flash flood guidance at each forecast office, but doesn't mean that they're not getting some information there, but certainly something that uh, is needed. Okay, um, let's check the chat here. Um, yeah, Tim, uh, establishing mechanisms to fund tasked aircraft, UAV remote sensing is a challenge. Yeah, that's that's true. And, you know, particularly when wildfires are going on, um, you know, flying drones uh, grounds the firefighters. So uh, they can't fly drones unless the Forest Service is coordinating that. Um, and so uh, that's something that is a challenge as well. Uh, I've seen, I've seen uh, things published by the Forest Service saying, when you, when you fly and it's a picture of a drone, uh, we don't. Uh, and that's, uh, that's certainly very impactful. So, yep, Rama, the insurance industry is something that that could be willing to invest. And and these are these are all great ideas that, you know, regarding the wildfire, uh, what we'll do is we'll take these this conversation, we'll probably hand that over to the wildfire cluster as additional things to consider for uh, things that they might want to work on in the future. Um, 
So this is this is all great input. Um, so as far as trusted data sources go, uh, this is an example of uh, some of the data services that uh, that we've been able to identify. Now, those of you who work with uh, operational data sets, this comes from the National Weather Service. This is their web service GIS link, um, their web page. And uh, they have all sorts of uh, services that are populating this, this page. So as they add different services into their IDP system, uh, which is their operational um, uh, dissemination system for web services, there, you'll see them pop up and they have different uh, different topics. Under fire weather, uh, the only thing that they have currently in the non-cloud version of the IDP system is Storm Prediction Center fire weather outlooks. That's areas around the country that are likely uh, or, or to have conditions that would promote the spread of wildfire. But they're standing up a cloud version of IDP and they're putting up additional services into that cloud version, uh, which is, I don't think it's considered operational, uh, but it is uh, supported 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And of course the services keep running. We're testing some of these services within GeoCollaborate as well, but one is the Storm Prediction Center Fire Weather Outlook, and then the Weather Service Spot Forecasts. So spot forecasts are really interesting. Any emergency manager, uh, wildfire um, manager, burn, uh, burn boss, who has a prescribed burn uh, or any other request, uh, maybe it's a rescue, uh, can call the National Weather Service and request a spot forecast for their latitude and longitude for what they're doing. And within 30 minutes, the National Weather Service will issue a spot forecast uh, for that activity. So that uh, uh, we are actually consuming that feed and within the GeoCollaborate dashboard can see every spot forecast that's been requested in real time uh, and there are these little dots that are that pop up all over the country. So that's that's very interesting. I haven't seen any products related to burn scars uh, from from NOAA or the National Weather Service. I don't know if any are planned um, in the future. I know that there's a lot of discussion going on about future services uh, that NOAA could offer. And uh, they got a lot of money for the infrastructure uh, program and also the disaster supplemental uh, to put towards wildfires. Uh, and uh, the, the NOAA has a wildfire uh, team together where they're putting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, brain power into that team uh, on what kind of services uh, that they might offer. Um, uh, the US Forest Service also offers live or updated 24 hours uh, every 24 hours, unless they do it more frequently at times, the fire perimeter data in a geospatial format as well. So you can see active fire perimeters and they will change as they're updated by the Forest Service's GTAC, the geospatial um, uh, support office there uh, for, for wildfires. And so one of the things I just like to ask you is, if you have knowledge of web services from any agency organization, I know the Bureau of Land Management does uh, a lot of uh, web services. They have a terrific website up in Alaska where they're supporting Alaska wildfires. Um, share those in the chat. You know, if you're with a, a non-governmental organization, um, any federal agency, state agency, um, share those resources in the chat, please, and we will consume them, uh, and we can put those services into the ESIP ecosystem of innovation to then increase the awareness of decision makers of these data sets, uh, because, you know, as web services, how they work, you know, uh, uh, GIS systems don't uh, download and share and re-share re that data they pull directly from those web services. So your website, your portal, your hub will get increased activity uh, because of sharing these services. And I assume that's why you would be putting those services together 
to really get the word out and get the data put to use um, across many areas. And so, so please share those services uh, in, in the chat. And I see some uh, coming in, uh, which are great. Uh, uh, thanks, Zach, for, for putting uh, some of that uh, information in into the chat and some others. Uh, NIFSI, yes. Um, NIFSI is a, is a great organization. It's sort of the operational interagency fire center in Boise, Idaho. As a matter of fact, the Weather Service has a person that's working out of there, uh, Heath Hockenberry from the, from the fire program. And there's, uh, there's a forecast office in Boise there. Uh, right next to NIFSI on the same campus. And so uh, they put together a lot of active uh, wildfire data, uh, which we uh, love taking a look at as well. So um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to just pause sharing here for a second, uh, just so um, I can take a look at the, the clock. Um, we've gone a little bit little bit over for uh, for this particular section, but I do want to take a pause uh, and ask anybody for input on the chat. Um, unmute yourself, turn your camera on. Let's start a little conversation uh, about um, your thoughts with post wildfire threats. Uh, is it something you may have heard? You're not sure is true. You want to talk about? Uh, so please, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Come online and introduce yourself. Say hello. Uh, if we don't have anybody that wants to add anything to the conversation, we will move on to the um, second half of the disaster lifecycle cluster, which is what should we do uh, going forward? So, Zach, thanks a lot for, for sharing those links. I'll just take a pause. Let anybody else uh, speak up if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, it's it's Brahma? yeah yeah it's it's mostly uh, uh, post wildfire. Mostly what we hear about is uh, uh, mudslides and flooding uh, risks. Uh, living in California, I hear that quite a bit. And uh, how they uh, over the last year or so in Santa Barbara County, I think they uh, took some positive action to prevent the. Uh, uh, disaster, um, uh, prevent the uh, mudslides from, uh, deb deb I think they did something to block the debris flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know all the details about it, but uh, they've taken some action in that area. And they were saying the most recent uh, heavy rains that we had, they said this was quite effective. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, uh, Rama. Thanks for that. And and in our wildfire cluster yesterday, we had um, Jessica Block, who spoke from UCSD and their Wi-Fi lab. Uh, and she was um, sent me a text message after said, sorry, I was running a little bit late. She was actually doing a briefing uh, to the Office of Emergency Services on a landslide that they're monitoring right now uh, in California that is slowly moving. And they're going to be uh, they're tasking some some flyovers so they can kind of gauge a speed because it's a fairly significant part of a hillside uh, that is uh, moving because of the saturation. So I know there's there's uh, additional work and, you know, we're going to be working with the Wi-Fi lab to see what kind of data services they might have for from wildfire behavior to any of this kind of landslide modeling that we can bring uh, to the discussion uh, both in wildfire and disaster life cycle clusters, because um, we'd like to monitor this. We're, we're really digging for what kind of information is out there uh, that can be shared, that can be used by decision makers, even all the way to the public for non-technical decision makers who don't know how to read this stuff and don't know how to understand it. So we're hoping that we can educate them as well in such a way that you know they're not using the data to misinform themselves uh, but using it to enhance their awareness. So are you talking only about post-wildfire threat as opposed to post-wildfire recovery actions? Well, um, because that's what we talked about before, but it doesn't mean uh, that post-wildfire recovery actions aren't a part of the post-wildfire 
um, you know, threat because there, there's, there's all sorts of issues that happen after wildfires. And if it requires or could benefit from use of remote sensing data, modeling, AI, things like that, that's something that we want to hear about. Okay, anybody else? I'll share, I'll start sharing the screen. Thanks so much, uh, Rama. I'll uh, re-resume uh, the sharing uh, just to show you that we're entering the second part uh, now of the disaster life cycle cluster. This is one that will hopefully get your, um, get your input, your excitement uh, about, because uh, we're, we want your input of where the future of the disaster life cycle cluster is going to go. Um, now, as part of this, I've asked um, Maggie Glasgow to uh, talk about uh, one of her flooding projects uh, that she's been working on. And um, Maggie, I know that you asked before we started the, the meeting as to whether or not you could share your screen. Do you know if you can share it or not? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. I'm, in, I'm in the web. I didn't, I forgot to log into um, uh, Chrome to see if it would give me the share um, option. But um, at this point, I'm in Safari. I'm going to stay in Safari. And if you wouldn't mind driving, that would be great. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm just looking at um, opening up my place where I saved your presentation. And I'll, I'll turn my camera on briefly while um, you're sure. you're doing that because I think for bandwidth reasons, I'm not gonna be able to keep it on, but. Okay, yeah, um, please introduce yourself, Maggie, thanks. Is my video actually working? Oh, yep, I see myself. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dave and Karen for giving me this opportunity to brief you on um, a flood project that I've been working on that's been funded out of the NASA Disasters Program. So um, I'm gonna quit my video and then um, perhaps later during discussion, if anybody has any questions, I can pop back on. Thanks, Maggie. And I'm loading your presentation here now. And um... I will go into present here and uh, resume. So can you see, uh, whoops, is that, uh, can you see your presentation, Maggie, or do I need to change something? I still see the Slido questions. Okay. You okay, might be stand. sharing, um, yep. you might need to reshare with uh, the- um, You're right, you're right. PowerPoint, yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, I see it now. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Sure. Um, so the project that I've been working on since uh, 2019 uh, it involves uh, flood severity forecasting, and we've just now launched uh, a portion of that on uh, Pacific Disaster Center's Disasterware, which is a global uh, multi-hazard alerting system. And so um, this is one of the, the first flood early warning um, products to be made available. So um, it's called uh, the Global Initiative for Flood Forecasting and Alerting, or GIFT. Uh, I am the PI of the project, and um, the folks that I'm going to uh, acknowledge just right now are the team that helped to develop uh, the model of models, which is the basis for doing these uh, flood alerts. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, uh, that's our uh, project URL. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is just a, a quick chart uh, to, to kind of summarize what we've been doing for GIFT. Uh, this, is, uh, this project is an extension of several of the A.37 uh, disasters um, projects that were funded um, under, uh, out of disasters. Um, I think the call was in 2018. We started work in 2019. Uh, in 2021, we were given the opportunity to combine some of the projects to come up with a, um, a global flood alerting uh, system uh, that we're working with PDC to uh, deploy. Uh, so the main portion of what I'm going to be speaking about is 
uh, results from my own A37, uh, but there's some other um, information splashed in about the two other A37s, one which is uh, Franz Meyer's SAR-based uh, observations to identify flood extents, and Charlie Hike's um, A37, which is about infrastructure and risk and exposure um, analysis. So as you can see here, we're um, deploying an ensemble uh, flood model called Model of Models. It integrates open source hydrologic model outputs with um, optical and SAR imagery uh, to forecast flood severity daily across the globe. And we're working with, again, PDC, Pacific Disaster, uh, Pacific Disaster Center, to deploy this on their disaster aware platform. Uh, there's some end users identified there. And just kind of the important thing to kind of note is that we're using three flood models, GLOFAST, GFMS, and HWRF. So HWRF does um, sort of storm surge and um, uh, storm related uh, outputs. And then GLOFAST and GFMS are the more uh, traditional riverine type flooding um, uh, models that give you uh, a forecast of where um, based on precipitation, they would expect the floods to occur. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick conceptual uh, uh, diagram of what we're doing with this pr uh, project. Um, there are several existing um, and ongoing efforts for flood, pro <clears throat> flood products, which are outlined in the blue, and some proposed work that we have um, been working on uh, as uh, in this extension from the A37. So as you can see here, there, it's, a, it's a pretty big complicated picture, but what we're doing is using the MOM to create a severity alert that uh, triggers the um, analysis of um, remote sensing information and the exposure analysis all of that is sort of compiled into um, products that are deployed on the PDC cloud and served through DisasterWare. Um, and it goes into this flood hazard conta uh, container, which uh, includes the smart alert for hazards, uh, information about severity, flood extent, and depth. And then um, ultimately are going to be creating hazard briefs and automated products and bookmarks and hazard specific layers within um, disaster aware. Next slide, please. Uh, so I, I promised a, a, a explanation of, of uh, the main component that is triggering all of this analysis and it's called the model of models. It is currently deployed um, on PDC's live server. So it is the information from this uh, product is being disseminated globally on a daily basis. And uh, MOM is an ensembled model that forecasts severity at a sub watershed level daily. Um, as I mentioned, it, it incorporates three um, flood models and then we use um, uh, MODIS and VIRS to, to um, validate. And um, we're able then to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, identify flood risk at a regional level because we're using the sub watershed um, information from WRI. And this uh, severity information is used to obtain and process the high resolution earth observation data. And that helps us to determine the actual extent of the flood and the assessment of um, the impacts to, to society and critical infrastructure from the flood. So this is just a quick diagram that shows sort of the workflow of what happens in model of models. You have the four models plus um, Earth observation. I think we lost you, Maggie. Is, is everybody else still here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Her, her audio quit. Yeah, let's see if she's able to rejoin us. She's still there, so it really looks like a, a network drop. Right. Mm 
Yeah, which is why she <laughs> wanted me to share the slides. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Let me just put into the chat. Uh, See if she comes back now. When Maggie comes back to to um, wrap up her presentation, I'd love for everybody to think about this. is just one example of floods, um, you know, and in what projects are are being funded to put together this sort of global flood product. But there's a lot in the disaster domain, and um, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna go to a another Slido poll and ask you to input. What do you think is something unique that the, you would like to see the disaster lifecycle cluster uh, focus on? And we'll be getting to that after uh, we hear from Maggie. Maggie, have you joined us back? Let me send her a, a text. I believe I have her, her number. Maggie is uh, rejoining us. Excellent. <laughs> hey, Maggie, have you, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. My uh, internet connection was flaky and it just dropped me. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up really quickly, Dave, because I know that I waste a lot of time here. So no, 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 no worries. <laughs> we enjoyed talking about you. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, so right now with the, um, with the GIFT project, we are currently working with uh, Pacific Disaster Center, but we have identified um, other potential partners. And if you're interested in working with us on um, trying to get MOM or, or any of this information into, <clears throat> excuse me, your own geospatial platform, please let me know. So right now, um, MOM is derived um, daily and identifies risk information for alerting. And then uh, this information includes potential impacts and vulnerable populations at the subwatershed level. So on the right here, we just see the information flow where we see the, the model models, um, identifying the flood event, um, feeding into disaster aware, and then using um, that information to uh, trigger other processing, uh, including the flood extent and uh, flood shape. And then from there, PDC creates these outputs, the smart alerts, the hazard briefs, and um, automates these um, flood products so that it can be disseminated globally. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this was uh, sort of uh, hinted at in that title slide that Dave uh, provided, but this is what the uh, flood incidents look like globally within uh, disaster aware. So you can see that there's um, flood incidents that are identified there in the, in the red. Um, and in this particular uh, image, uh, we're only looking at the flood um, output, but you can look at um, the 20 plus hazards that are included um, in uh, disaster where it includes like wildfire, tsunami, earthquake, et cetera. So right now we're just looking at floods and then um, Dave, next slide, please. Here's what uh, model of models um, ultimately looks like within um, disaster where. So you can see that there's uh, different polygons um, that represent the sub watershed level. Um, I think it's a, I can't remember what, what level watershed it is, but you can see the um, areas in the polygons that are identified as having a flood risk. And what we're really um, concentrating on are those red areas. Um, and so as you can see on the side there, we use the same uh, nomenclature as the National Weather Service where we have advisories, watches, and warnings. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and I should also mention that there's over uh, 7,000 um, uh, official users um, registered within disaster aware, but um, you can also 
download Disaster Alert, which is a free app um, on your phone, and you can get these alerts. Um, it just won't have as, as much information there, but you can identify the areas that are predicted to have some flooding, and I believe you can see the, the polygons. So as you hear, see here, um, we have uh, the MOM within Disaster Aware, and this is in the live server. So you can um, pick your global flood hazard layers on the, the left here. The middle um, top uh, image there shows um, all the information that is uh, available from the MOM, including the severity alerts that are um, uh, the ensemble model that creates uh, the uh, alert level uh, based on the hydro models and um, the validation of the areas by the remote sensing. And then you can also see the GLOFAS and uh, HF, uh, bleh, GFMS um, inputs there. Uh, the GLOFAS uh, gives you rasters, which you can um, see there, and then the points are from GFMS. So what we're doing is uh, leveraging uh, each of these information um, products to highlight um, how, how we would communicate this. Um, and uh, PDC is, is being kind to, of course, uh, recognize that this is a NASA and PDC joint uh, venture. So the, um, the uh, outputs will um, say that this is from NASA. And then the bottom right here shows uh, an example of what that hazard brief or hazard report looks like. So on the right, you see that there's the polygons that have been um, identified as uh, having um, potential uh, risk. And again, we're concentrating on those red areas that are predicted as having the highest risk. Um, the, this, this report also includes the rainfall that's associated with this area, and it does a quick exposure um, calculation to tell um, what uh, population has been affected and whether or not critical infrastructure is affected within the area that's identified. Next slide, please. So again, here's just another example of this output and how it is displayed in Disaster Aware. So this was uh, taken on October 24th of last year. And you can see that this event is identified as um, a tropical cyclone and has the remnants of this, um, this cyclone. And so again, we see the uh, or hazard report on the right there that identifies the areas of severity, again, concentrating on the red. And then you also have the associated rainfall and the exposure information. And um, on the bottom there, uh, it gives you a little, uh, it's, on, it's on this one too. So don't worry about it, Dave. It's all, there's another brief that has that information as well. So you can okay. see on the bottom of that panel that it tells you, it's got the, the uh, legend, which tells you what the uh, flood severities within the watershed are. And then it also um, identifies some of the um, potentially exposed infrastructure. And then the, the blue there, um, defines the exposure area. Uh, so we've got a couple of ideas for future directions. We want to integrate um, SAR and other high resolution earth observation and hydrologic flood products into this framework to help calibrate and validate the predictions from the flood models. Uh, we'd like to integrate DEMs for flood depth information because um, right now it, it identifies the extent. We want to operationalize the processing of optical imagery based on the severity trigger and develop a data-driven uh, set of algorithms based on the current data to help forecast the, the severity at sub-watershed level basins. And we'd like to incorporate some new um, earth observations and models. Uh, we also want to uh, assess climate justice of uh, the basins that are identified as being at risk. We wanna identify populations that are vulnerable to the flood impacts for resource planning and policymaking, and also uh, do a, a, a in-depth assessment of infrastructure resilience of the impacted communities. Um, I think the next slide, Dave, is my last one. Yes, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, that's my email. I'll put it in the chat, and I can also put the in the chat the uh, URLs for um, both the project and for disaster aware. And I just want to acknowledge, of course, that this work 
was funded by the Applied Sciences Disasters Program. Thank you. That's great, Maggie. Thanks so much. Um, if anybody has any questions for Maggie, um, you know, please uh, speak up or put them in the chat. Maggie, I, I had a, a question for you, particularly with the, the, the flood aware products that get generated for the, for the U.S. Have you done any correlation between like what you think based on the, the data where flooding might be and like actual uh, watches, warnings or advisories issued by the weather service? So one of the things that we have um, sort of tried to establish is that we're not doing uh, the severity alerts or the flood early warning for CONUS because mm -hmm. that's in the purview of the National uh, Weather Service. Gotcha. Um, we, we could um, do, a, do a sort of um, calibration validation on how well we're predicting the flooding areas within the U.S., but um, in no way, shape or form is, is uh, the uh, alerting a, um, you know, author authoritative um, sort of uh, analysis, but because um, PDC does um, import the information from uh, the National Weather Service as the authoritative source for uh, CONUS related events. But what we're trying to do is, is kind of um, offer uh, a solution globally so that folks that don't have uh, the, the ability to um, predict or assess the impact of floods would have a tool to be able to use that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just thinking as you were, as you were presenting, it would be really cool to see how, you know, the work with the national water model, um, you know, works with this and identifying areas of flooding. I mean, of course, the weather service is on top of all the, the CONUS monitoring and, and issuing of watches and warnings and stuff like that. But it would be interesting to see how, you know, because you're, you're getting data from other models and other, you know, uh, organizations to see how that comes together. Is there any additional information that we might get from this? Uh, or is there um, something that, that the weather service could say, hey, that looks really interesting. We might want to test that. Yeah, so uh, we do use a, a US-based model and then uh, GLOFAS is uh, uh, provided by the EU. Um, I, so what we're doing is, is, is initially, you know, providing a, an alert that is um, created by this ensemble model uh, and sort of in the future direction we really do want to incorporate as much of the high resolution uh, earth observation data to be able to calibrate the area that's identified by the MOM. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure how we would really address uh, working with uh, NOAA, but we have been uh, speaking to, to them about what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and the other thought that hit me is the response uh, uh, you know, organizations, humanitarian organizations that, that, you know, could use it as a kind of a first, first uh, hint at where flooding could be based on what's going on um, for, for their responses. Now, this is, yes, yeah, so that's definitely uh, true. Um, uh, it is, it is based on the, the flood models. So there is kind of a, 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 a time window that these are available, but we do create the MOM based output daily. Um, and I think that PDC runs it um, even even uh, more often than that. Yeah. And what what's the what's the outlook for um, for continuing support for this? Is applied sciences taking it up to a point and then it ends, or are you looking to keep keep it going? So yeah, the project will end this year under the um, applied sciences uh, funding. But we are looking to partner with um, other organizations to be able to, you know, expand the uh, the different components of the project. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're basically ready to hand this off to PDC and have them run it. Wow. it. It is right now, but at the end of project, it will it will definitely be um, a handoff with a little bit of um, work on the tech transfer. Sure, sure. Well, that sounds great. Do, us, do we have any other questions um, in the chat? I don't see anything in the chat. Anybody online that uh, uh, that has any questions for Maggie?
Okay. Well, that sounds great. Maggie, thanks. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. I'm going to uh, stop the share here for a second so I can uh, go back to uh, go back to the the slides because we have one more to go and we have about 10 minutes to go in the in the rest of this session. Um, what, what I and, and you know Maggie gave a presentation on one one example of a project uh, where a couple of them came together and started to work on a you know put together this flood alerting capability that's global. Um, but from what you all have heard, uh, everybody that's online here uh, about the disaster lifecycle cluster, and you can enter anything that you want uh, that you feel like, hey, this would be really cool uh, to do. Um, and uh, what I want to do is go back here to Zoom and share my screen. I'd like you to answer this final poll question from Slido. And um, it should be up in your app. Uh, if you have it on your phone, what what do you think is something unique that the, the disaster lifecycle cluster could look at over the next year? You know, we're thinking in the in in Burlington. You know, we could have a poster. Um, we're also uh, looking for. I, I'd like uh, anybody to put into the chat as well. Um, if you're interested, uh, some of you said you're ready to roll up your sleeves. Um, I'd like to rotate off as co-chair of the disaster lifecycle cluster, but I will still participate. Uh, Maggie has um, indicated that she's interested in becoming one of the co-chairs of the disaster lifecycle cluster. And I'd like for you to put into the chat if you're interested, if you have some interest. Um, we also have uh, a meeting uh, every month. It's the uh, first Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna let you answer these question, this question here. Think about what you wanna say. Uh, I'll be quiet and I'll monitor the chat if anybody's interested in becoming part of the, sort of the, 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 the leaders of the disaster life cycle cluster. And your input here is is important because um, ESIP is driven by the community, and the community has started the ESIP disaster lifecycle cluster, and we want to do something that really uh, uh, is of interest to this community. Yeah, it's a good one. The first, uh, both of them are really good. You know, might we, might we become a cluster that focuses on presenting what we're doing in the disasters area uh, to other organizations, reaching out beyond ESA, um, you know, bringing this, bringing this data, uh, working with other clusters. All of that is all of that is open, and we're going to take the next several weeks and and process this and and um, want you also to be uh, active members of this cluster. We have an email list you can join, and uh, I believe I have that on the final slide that I'm going to show as well. These are good. Yeah, keep the input coming. These are all great ideas. Looks like we have four inputs so far with two more being typed. So uh, those of you who are, who are thinking, uh, please type in. No wrong answers either. We're a friendly bunch.
Chad, I see your uh, I see your note in the chat. Uh, that's great. Thank you. And I think with uh, I think with this uh, Slido, you can put in more than one answer if you want to. If you have a couple of ideas you want to put in, that's great too. Your input matters. We have six people that have inputted. Oh, good. Another one started typing. Thanks. And uh, how about a couple of more? You have any ideas? Even if it's I'm not sure, you can put that in. Focus on enhancing community resilience in tandem. There is a community resilience cluster within ESIP, and uh, it might be something that uh, we could go to them and, and say, hey, this is what we want to work on together and have some joint uh, efforts. Uh, so that's all possible as well. Uh, with the number of customer, uh, customers, <laughs> that's a, there's a new word for you, a cluster that's a customer. We'll call them a customer. Um, uh, the uh, <laughs> that's I'll put that into my own dictionary. Um, so that's uh, that's great. And ESIP is always interested, you know, so we don't have a hundred clusters having clusters that work together um, and uh, each taking our strengths and moving forward with them, but having some common goal is a is a nice. Uh, a nice vision to have as well. Okay, let's see, we have just uh, three minutes left. Uh, we have a couple of more participants typing in, so please keep them coming. Uh, while you're typing, I'm going to go to the next, um, or to the, uh, the final slide here. Um, and just a little verbal yes from somebody. Can you see the reminder slide up? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is just a reminder for everybody. We have disaster life cycle cluster calls. Every, oops, this is not, this is not right. The second Wednesday, that's not right. Uh, it's the first Thursday of every month. Oh, goodness. Um, I know what happened there. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is we're we're not going to have a February meeting, but we'll have a March meeting. Uh, don't pay attention to that actual day. It's the first Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we will process what we what we collected here in this cluster. Um, and we'll have um, uh, myself and Maggie as co-chairs. We'll talk. Uh, we'll talk with you, Chad, uh, to see what your. Um, interest is and in potentially being a, a co-chair, which would be pretty awesome. Um, and yeah. um, we have the disaster email list as well. This disasters email list is something that um, maybe you can put it into the into the chat. Um, Allison, yeah, thank you, Karen. March second at four p.m. is the first uh, is the first Thursday. So we'll meet then and we'll have some readouts and, and uh, pathways forward that we'll suggest for the disaster lifecycle cluster. And of course we have the notes uh, that are available. So I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, we have a minute left, um, uh, but uh, Karen, if you'd like to have any closing comments, uh, please. Uh, no, no, uh, no big surprises here, but uh, Dave, I think, uh, you did a terrific job on summarizing uh, our recent work in the uh, uh, in the disasters cluster, and I really appreciate Maggie's uh, view on on flooding because I I do feel that I don't know that we have a, a cluster that focuses on flooding and uh, living in the East Coast as I do. That is our major concern. So. Um, I, I think there's some real potential for moving forward and uh, yeah, look, look forward to seeing how this uh, unfolds for us. Excellent. Well, thank you, Karen. And Karen, thank you so much for all of your efforts. Karen's going to be rotating off as a co-chair, but Karen, I, I applaud you and salute you for um, all of your uh, dedicated work, you know, 
it, it's, it says in Karen's title that she's retired from NASA. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if you, you're working more or uh, what, uh, but uh, really do appreciate all your inputs and uh, yeah, leadership. It's definitely a different way to retire. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps the brain sharp, that's it for does. sure. Um, and, and we really appreciate it. And Karen's going to be active and has been active in the air quality cluster uh, and is doing a, a terrific job there uh, as well. So um, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you participating. And um, uh, I see all the, the, the messages coming, all the thank yous to Karen. This is, this is great. So uh, everybody, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your uh, day at ESIP and um, on the last day as well uh, of ESIP. And I really want to give a shout out to the ESIP staff. They've done a terrific job uh, helping to organize things, giving us the support that we need and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I hope that they get some time to take some breaths uh, early into next week as well. So thanks everybody for joining. And uh, I think that's uh, going to be it. Uh, and, and of course, in the last second, um, I hope that we are recording this uh, session. I don't know if we were. Yes, it is. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Yes. That's great. Well, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, thank you.